get started with today's lab lecture. First of all, there is a sign-up sheet going around for Chem Club, so if you want to sign up on that sign-up sheet, I, it's the same sign-up sheet that went around during, if one, one went around during organic lecture. So um, just pass it around and eventually have it end up back up here. Um, if you didn't get to sign up before for Chem Club, you can do that now. Um, I'm going to go through these announcements here in a little bit, and this is where I'm going to always put um, the weekly announcements, um, things to keep in mind for each week. Um, but first of all, what I want to show you is this year, and we, we got this to work last year, so we felt really accomplished, so we're going to try it again this year. Um, we're videotaping lab lecture, and so that David is down here videotaping lab lecture for hey. you. Um, and so we're going to post it on the Moodle site, the Moodle courses that is for all of the lab sections. So when you go to your Moodle courses, it's going to be posted under this um, site. And each week, I'm going to have pre-lab le lecture listed under there. Other possible things will pot uh, potentially be listed under there. But we will put um, the lab lecture up there, and it's, it's linked to YouTube, so you'll go out to YouTube to watch lab lecture. Um, so if there's a week that you can't make to the lab lecture, or you um, there's some other conflict that arises, or you want to re-watch um, lab lecture and see what was covered, that will be up there for you. The one couple warnings I'm going to put out there for you is it's not... It's not the perfect video, so it's meant to be out there to be helpful for you, to be a tool for you, but it's not meant to be a substitute for you being here in the seats in lab lecture. So it's not perfect. Um, things, you know, sometimes things may not be completely clear, perfectly clear on the board, or you may not hear perfectly clearly on the video. So if you do miss lab lecture, I highly recommend you get at least someone else's notes to also go along with watching the video so that you make sure that you have all the information that you need. Also, from time to time, there's going to be things I hand out in lab lecture, so make sure that you get those um, handouts if you happen to miss a lab lecture where those things are handed out, okay? So it's meant to be up there as a tool to help you out, but it's not meant to be the substitute for you being here 4 o'clock every Monday in the seats, okay? Um, so now let's go through... Um, couple announcements and we'll talk about what we're going to cover today and then we'll jump right on in. So um, my name is Professor Smith. I'm the coordinator for all of the seven lab sections this semester. So I teach two of them, coordinate all of them, and I'll be the person that's, um, unless something else arises, that I'll be primarily the person that's giving the lab lecture each week. Um, so like I said, each week I'm going to put announcements over here, um, things, deadlines to keep in mind, um, other things that have come up along the way, things that I need you to be aware of that aren't necessarily going to be in your lab manual. So um, first of all, always bring a calculator to lab. You're going to need to make calculations in lab. Make sure you always have your calculator with you, um, including for quizzes. Um, and cell phones aren't a substitute for a calculator. So starting this week, starting if you have lab, 7.30 tomorrow morning, make sure you have your calculator with you each lab period. Um, this week, we're going to finish up the experiment that you started last week. So we'll finish up experiment one, and we'll, you'll get your first quiz. So the quiz, this typically the quiz is going to be over whatever you are doing in lab that week, okay? But this, this week's quiz has two weeks um, that we can pull information from last week and this week, as well as any quiz could have safety information on it, okay? So at any point in the semester, we could always put safety questions on the quiz. That'll be fair game throughout the semester. Um, <clears throat> next week, we'll be, going, we'll be doing experiment two, um, and then in two weeks, your first lab report is due. So your experiment one lab report is due two weeks from, from either Tuesday or Thursday this week. I put up here the open lab times. Um, these are times outside of designated lab periods when the labs will be open and the stockroom attendant will be present. So it's basically Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 9.30 in the morning till 3.30 in the afternoon. <coughs> these could change if there isn't, for whatever reason, if there was a not a professor available that we had to shut the labs for a certain portion of time, that could happen. 
or a especially on Fridays if we end up having a, um, this is based on having chemistry seminars at four o'clock on Fridays. If we have a seminar that's earlier than four, then the labs would close a half hour before that seminar, okay? But these will be predominantly the open lab times during um, the semester. So with open lab, go, the same rules that apply to lab apply to open lab. So always wear safety glasses. Always be dressed appropriately for lab. So long, you know, Shirts cover, basically you want to cover yourself neck to your ankles, okay? So short sleeve shirts, pants, um, shoes that cover your entire foot. So if you come to open lab, not dressed appropriately, you're going to be sent back to go get the proper clothes, okay? So just like your regular lab section, you have to be dressed um, properly for it. So no shorts. I know it's really nice out, but no shorts in open lab. So bring, if you're coming to open lab, bring your shoes with you, bring pants you can slide on with you, and then once you're done with open lab, you can be done with that stuff. Um, another reminder um, for cleaning up and tidying up after you're done with your lab each week, make sure, first of all, put common equipment where common equipment goes. So when you checked into the lab last week, you had a whole um, list of things that went into the common equipment drawer and cabinet. Make sure it goes back in there, otherwise you might get a note from this um, instructor after your lab section because their student couldn't find what they needed, okay? So um, if you get a little not so nice pink slip in your drawer, that means you took something out of common equipment that shouldn't have been in there. So try and avoid getting pink slipped, basically. Um, <clears throat> and then make sure you clean up your area really well after, at the end of lab. Make sure you clean up your hood, um, not just wipe it down, but dry it out. I saw a lot of very wet, in almost flooded hoods last um, week at the end of the lab period and make sure the outside wherever you're working outside of your hood is cleaned up each week too okay so that's part of safety and technique is also cleaning up after you are done um, I'm going to go over now a few things um, on the syllabus so everybody should have the syllabus because it's in it's the front page first page of your lab meeting. so I want to talk about a few things with that first of all um, why it's important to come to lab lecture itself. Um, this is the only place that you're going to have the information that I'm going to be covering, okay? So um, the lab profs, even though we talked a lot last week, we're not gonna talk a lot again in lab. So this is the only place you're going to get that information um, besides what is in your your lab manual, but the actual lab lecture, this is the only place you're going to get it. Each week you're going to have a quiz, which we kind of already talked about. So quiz material is going to come from lab lecture, as well as what's in your lab manual. Um, and not everything that I talk about is in your lab manual. Um, and then at the end of the semester, everybody is going to take a final exam together. And so lab lecture is a really good place for final exam um, questions to come from. So. Um, to know what's going on in lab, be, well, be prepared for your quiz and be ready for your final exam at the end of the semester. All really good reasons to um, come to lab lecture each week. So with our final exam, I want to point that out to you because everybody in here will have the same, well, same final exam time. And it is going to be given this year the last day of final exam week in the last time slot. So we're the 12.30 to 2.30 time slot on the Friday of final exam week. And everybody will be taking the exam together. We're not going to give the exam at an earlier date or anything like that, okay? So Friday, December 12th, it's still 13 days before Christmas, okay? So we're not backing up to Christmas too close. Um, the final exam will be given in here at 12.30, from 12.30 to 2.30 on that Friday. And everybody is taking it together. It's based on this time slot for the pre-lab lecture. So the Monday, Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 4 o'clock, all classes Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 4 o'clock will be giving their final exam during that time. Okay? So just mark that on your calendar so you've got it when you're planning your departure from campus. You've got everything prepared. Um, so now... First of all, any questions you guys have? Okay, so let's talk about what we did last week and then go into what we are going to be doing this week. 
So last week, you guys got an unknown. It had a neutral compound in it, and it had a carboxylic acid in it. You depronated your carboxylic acid with sodium hydroxide, got that dissolved in the aqueous solution. Then you added hexane, your neutral compound dissolved in that hexane. Then you did an extraction with your stuff funnel, separated your hexane layer and your aqueous layer. Okay? Your hexane layer should be hanging out in your round bottom flask in your drawer right now. You didn't do anything else with it, but put it in the round bottom flask. The, um, Aqueous layer, you then went and added HCl to it and propionated your carboxylic acid and then filtered it and you should have your <coughs> crude solid carboxylic acid right now, okay? So now what we need to do is we'll recrystallize our carboxylic acid. We're going to do what's called a simple distillation to remove the hexane off of our neutral compound and then we're going to recrystallize our neutral compound. So these, these three steps are recrystallization here, simple distillation, recrystallization. That's what we're going to be doing in lab this week. Okay? And so um, a few things we need to talk about before we um, look at each of these things individually is, first of all, um, recrystallization and what's important with recrystallization. So in your lab manual, there is... A table of solvents, and it's a, the polarities of common solvents and compounds. And as you go up, things are increasing in polarity. And so we're going to use this table um, as kind of where we base what we're going to pick our recrystallization solvents off of. Okay? So keep that table in mind. And then I'm going to give you a couple of guidelines for. Uh, recrystallization. So um, there's three kind of basic requirements for a good solvent. <coughs> And you guys won't have to pick your solvents this week, but this is how, how those solvents were picked. So you want to keep these in mind for, for future as well. Um, so first of all, when we are recrystallizing, recrystallizing is a method of purification of the solid. We don't want any reaction going on between the solid that you're trying to purify and the solvent that you're using. Okay, You just want to clean it up, but you don't want it to react. So the solid must not react with the solvent. Number two, we don't want to use something that's super toxic um, when we are using a recrystallization solvent typically. Um, we, you're going to be heating that solvent up to boiling or near boiling, so you don't want those vapors to be super toxic that you're going to be handling. So the solvent or solvent vapors should not present significant health hazards. Now we're still going to do all of this in the hood, but you, you still don't want, want to be dealing with something that's super hazardous. Basically, 
hot solid. But not very soluble at room temperature or zero degrees. So the reason for this is with the recrystallization, we're going to crystallize that solid out of that solvent. So we want to get it dissolved in the solvent when it's hot, but then as it cools down, we want those crystals to start crystallizing out and be insoluble in that solvent, so then we can filter out um, the crystals themselves. Now, what a key to this to make them purified is we want the impurities to not change their solubility in the solvent. We don't want them more soluble in warm solvent and then less soluble in cold solvent. We want them to have a consistent solubility. I'm going to go through an example here to kind of show you what all of, what this means, especially in number three. So, say we've got our cold solvent, whatever that is. We've got our solid, whatever that is that we want to recrystallize. This week it'll be either our um, carboxylic acid or our neutral compound. And whatever impurities are present. <coughs> so say our solid in cold solvent is soluble to the degree of 0.1 grams of it will dissolve in 100 grams of solvent. And so that's kind of that last bit here of a little bit of solubility. You'll have a little bit of solubility of solid and impurities in the cold salt. And then <coughs> our impurities, about 0.01 grams of solid, will dissolve in 100 grams of solvent. So what we want to see is increased solubility here no change in solubility here. So in the hot solvent, say we get 10 grams of our solid to dissolve in 100 grams of solvent, but our impurities, it's still 0.01 grams, is dissolved in 100 grams, okay? And so this would be a good, good change here, to go from 0.1 grams to 10 grams dissolved in 100 grams and then have no change here. This would be a good recrystallization solvent. Okay? Um, now, because you do still have a little bit of solubility of solid in cold solvent, the key to making this work is you always want to use a minimal amount of hot solvent Okay, when you are dissolving whatever you're trying to dissolve to recrystallize. Okay, And so make sure you follow the instructions in your lab manual um, because we've set them up such that you don't use too much solvent, okay? If you use too much solvent, 
Even in cold solvent, that solid's going to dissolve, and then you may not get that solid to crystallize back out again. You won't get it back out of the solvent. It'll stay dissolved, okay? So you always want to use just enough solvent that is hot. Make sure your solvent is hot on the hot plate um, to dissolve that solid, but not much more than that because then you may not crystallize back out. Does everybody understand that? Okay. Um, the other thing, besides minimal amount of solvent, so we want minimal amount of hot solvent used, The other thing is you need to let it cool slowly to room temperature and, and be undisturbed. You won't, don't want to move around the container that you have um, the crystals in. So cool slowly and undisturbed. shaking that flask that has your, your solid in it. Um, you want it to sit just nicely undisturbed, let it cool. So what I would do is, like with your carboxylic acid, once you um, do the recrystallization, you're, um, just put it in the back of your hood, let it slowly recrystallize out of that solvent, and then once it's slowly recrystallized out, you're then going to want to put it in an ice bath, so ice and water bath, make sure you've got all the crystals out, and then filter it, okay? So just put it put it to the side so you won't be shaking it around looking at it. Let it do its own thing um, on its own, okay? Now one thing that happens sometimes with recrystallization is once you get everything dissolved in the hot solvent, you still have these floaties that won't um, come out of or won't be dissolved, okay? And so we've got to do something with that material that's floating around. And what we do is what's called a hot filtration, okay? And so what you would do is you would have a hot plate here and you would have an Erlenmeyer flask on that hot plate with just a little bit of solvent in there that you heat um, so that the vapors are hot. And then you would um, use your either your powder funnel or your stemless funnel flute filter paper in here and then pour that recrystallization mixture through that filter paper to get those floaties out, okay? Now this is really tricky to do because first of all, this is hot. That's why it's a hot filtration. So you gotta be careful not to burn yourself. The other thing is a lot of times your solid wants to, as it's filtering through, just crash out on that filter paper. So it's really hard to keep it dissolved, okay? So if you think you need a hot filtration for one of your crystallizations, check with your lab prof first, okay? Make sure you really need it before you go ahead and take it on because sometimes it ends up a little bit messier um, than just filtering it through and then letting it recrystallize, okay? So make sure you really actually need to do this before you do it, all right? So um, here's kind of the steps for recrystallization if we're looking at our carboxylic acid. We, we're going to dissolve the carboxylic acid in a minimal amount of hot solvent. So the hot solvent you're using is ethanol. So you want your ethanol on your hot plate and you want your um, flask containing your crystals on your hot plate that you're adding the ethanol to. Keep those good and hot, okay? Um, then you're going to have a solution of, you want to get everything dissolved, all your carboxylic acid and the impurities. Um, if needed, you do a hot filtration, but hopefully you don't have to do a hot filtration. So then you just let everything, everything was dissolved, you let it slowly um, cool down, and then you would go on and filter it and leave the solvent and soluble impurities in that filtering, okay? 
Now, one other thing with this, um, the carboxylic acid recrystallization is you're using ethanol, but you're also using water. So you're going to get it dissolved in ethanol, and then it tells you to use hot water. So make sure you're using hot water. So it has been heated up, and you're going to add it to your flask that you've recrystallized in until either it's cloudy or you've added the same amount of water as ethanol, okay? So you're going to add until cloudy or amount of water added equals amount of ethanol added. So you want to, when you're adding the ethanol, you want to keep track of what volume you're adding. So then you know how much hot water to use as well, okay? You also want to keep track of the amount of ethanol because there's warnings in there as far as using too much of it, okay? So then once you're all set, you'll have everything filtered. Your carboxylic acid will be all done, okay? Now follow your um, lab props guidelines for time, but... In my labs, what I have people do is do the recrystallization of their carboxylic acid first, and then it just sits to the side while people then do um, the simple distillation of their hexane, because then once they're done with their simple distillation, usually their carboxylic acid is ready, okay? And so, to remove our hexane, we're going to use what is called a simple distillation. volatile and non-volatile components, okay? So the hexane that is in your neutral compound, that's your volatile component. So it is going to be what is distilled or boiled off, and then you're going to have your neutral compound. Its boiling point is super high, so we're going to use a water bath for this distillation. There's no way with the water bath would you be able to distill away your neutral compound, so it's going to be remaining when you're done, okay? So we've got our hexane that's volatile, our neutral compound that isn't very volatile, okay? And so what you're going to do is set up this guy here where you're going to have your hot plate and then you'll have your pan of hot water because you're going to use hot water for the distillation. Now, whenever you need to heat something with hot water, it really saves you tons of time to heat up hot water out of the tap. So run the hot water on the tap and get hot tap water or hot water out of the faucet, not cold water, and then try and heat the cold water and then get it up to boiling, okay? So use hot water from the faucet in here. You're going to have your flask that you have your um, neutral compound from last week in the hexane. Okay, and you're going to stick a stir bar in here. Now one thing, with a distilling flask, you don't want to fill it more than half full. So if it's more than half full from last week, let's transfer it to the next size flask, and we can rinse the current flask with a little hexane to make sure everything gets transferred. Okay? So you don't want this more than half full before you start the distillation. You always, always, always clamp the flask that you're heating. Okay? So you get this all set up, clamp that flask immediately. Okay, so don't get everything set up, then clamp the flask. This is the first thing you put a clamp on, all right? Then you're going to have your three-way adapter, or what's called the distillation head. You want everything nice and vertical, okay? 
you want this part of it all standing up straight so then when we get to the condenser that is slanted down to where it needs to drain so we're working with gravity okay then you're going to have your thermometer and thermometer adapter in your thermometer you want to go right below the curve in the distillation head or three-way adapter you want that tip of the thermometer right under that okay the reason for that is so then it's reading the temperature of that vapor right before it goes into the condenser So then um, you have T-clips, which you can clip here. You can also take a rubber band and rubber band from this arm of the condenser over here. So you're gonna use your Libid condenser, connect that guy on. You've got a support clamp here to the ring stand. So this clamp isn't tight, it's loose. It's just there to support the weight of that condenser because once you get water running through it, it's going to be a lot heavier, okay? So you want support clamp there, but not, not tight, just there to support it. And then you're kind of going to come down to your vacuum adapter, which we can use a T-clip to hold things together and use a rubber band. And then we're going to clamp our receiving flask. Make sure that's clamped nicely to the ring stand, okay? So you're gonna clamp, 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 make sure all your joints are put together so we don't lose any hexane before we get to the receiving flask, make sure everything's good and tight together. together. Um, and then you're going to connect hoses to your condenser. So the water goes in on the bottom, goes out on the top. The reason for that is you're fighting gravity. So if you push the water in on the bottom, then it'll fill the condenser before it drains out. If you put the water in here, it only partially fill the condenser before it drains out. Okay, so water in on the bottom, water out on top. Want to make sure the hoses are secure in your hood. Make sure when you put your water down from the water out that it's not going to pop out and flood the hood, okay? Because usually the person that gets flooded out of all this is not going to be you, it's going to be your hood mate that usually is the one that ends up flooded, okay? So be really careful so you don't make someone next to you very unhappy, all right? Um, once you have this all set up before you start heating, have your lab prof check it, okay? Make sure everything's set up correctly, all right? Now you're, you've got your round bottom with the hexane and the neutral compound. Um, your hexane's going to distill. Um, so what is going to end up in this collection flask? The hexane, right? So which flask do you want to keep with your neutral compound in it? going to be this guy, right? So as things distill, you'll probably see it start to turn cloudy because the hexane's being distilled off. You also want to watch the temperature because this temperature should correspond to the boiling point because it's reading the vapor temperature of that hexane. So it should correspond to the boiling point of the hexane. You always want to record where the boiling point where it starts and where it ends and also where it settles because sometimes the starting and ending boiling point are a little off but where it settles in and stays consistent, it should line up with the boiling point of that hexane, okay? Um, once you have all the hexane off, or you think you have all, most of the hexane off, then turn up the heat a little bit and push it a little harder to get all that hexane off. If you have residual hexane on that neutral compound, when you go, because it's really soluble in the hexane, when you go to crystallize it with the ethanol, it won't want to crash out because it's got too much hexane in there, okay? So think about your neutral compound is about two grams, okay? So it's going to be about two milliliters as well. It's not going to take up a ton of room in that round bottom flask, okay? So make sure um, you distill off as much hexane as possible. Push that hexane off before you turn off the distillation because otherwise if you add the ethanol, and then wait for it to crystallize and it doesn't crystallize off, then you're gonna take off the ethanol and the rest of the hexane and then add the ethanol again, okay? So it's faster to get all the hexane off first and push it longer the first time than cut it short and have to come back to this again, okay? The other thing with the simple distillation apparatus is when you are done, be really careful taking things apart because they're hot, okay? So let things cool down, then once things are cooled down, then start disassembling from this side 
and be really careful that this guy stays clamped really tight and doesn't end up dumping in the water because that's the product that you want. Okay? And then when you're done, you're still going to keep this guy warm, okay? And then you're going to add the ethanol that your lab manual tells you and then let that slowly crystallize out and then you'll filter this just like you'll filter your carboxylic acid. So both the carboxylic acid and the neutral compound when you're done with the recrystallization will be filtered back in filtration just like you used last week. Okay. So once you have your neutral compound and your carboxylic acid, then what we need to do is we need to um, figure out what they are. Okay. And so we're going to use melting points to do that. All right. And so we'll need to collect melting points of both compounds. And they'll kind of differ in what they need for each of them. So first, I just want to show you what, what is involved in collecting a melting point, what you're looking for. And then we'll talk about what we need specifically for each compound. So um, we'll have capillaries. We'll show you how to um, put solid in these capillaries this week. You're going to put just a little bit of solid, like really a couple millimeters of solid in these tiny capillaries, okay? Not very much at all. Then you're going to put it in a melting point apparatus. And what you are watching for, you're going to record a range that it melts over, okay? So what you are looking for is this range that it's going to um, melt over. Record starting with when it first starts melting, to when the last bit of solid melts, and that is that melting point range that you record. Okay? So it shouldn't be a huge broad range, since we now have crystallized solids um, that should be purified, you should have a really narrow melting point range. All right? But you want to record it um, from when it starts melting to when it finishes melting. If this range is really broad, then Look at the melting point again, make sure you're collecting the data correctly. If you think you're correct collecting the data correctly, then maybe it's still wet from the solvent that you use to recrystallize, so it needs to dry more, okay? So if you're getting really broad melting point ranges, then something's not quite right. It should be narrow ranges, all right? Okay, so there's two different melt temps that we have to use. We've got this guy that um, we have a lamp on him and then um, an observation window that you look at your capillaries going to be in this part, and then you have a switch and a, a voltage control here that controls how fast it heats up and controls the temperature, okay? Be really careful, don't burn your nose on the lamp, okay? Um, and then use that dial to control how fast you want it heated up, okay? Um, and we'll talk about here in a minute what, what range you want to use, okay? The other type of melt temp, so those are in 3129 and 3123, um, okay? The other type of melt temp has kind of a similar setup for where you put your um, sample, and then it's got this um, face on it for setting the temperatures that you're going to um, be uh, having it melt over, okay? And so you need to follow these, these instructions are with the melt temp, so you need to follow the instructions for, um, for collecting your melt temps, okay? Or for collecting your melting point ranges. And so you'll actually, instead of using the dial to set the temperature, you're going to um, use this guide for setting the temperature range over where it's going to heat and where it'll ramp up and so on and so forth. So when you're collecting your initial melting point ranges, you kind of want to set a broad range so you make sure you don't miss something. As you are collecting the more narrow melting point ranges, then you'll be able to program this a little bit more easily. Okay. So what we want to look at with the melting points is actually, I should put, put these guys up here so you can kind of see the ranges we're looking at. On the bottom here are our two um, neutral compounds, they differ quite a bit in melting point. One's 80 degrees, one's 54 degrees. Okay, so they have a broad difference, or a large difference. Our carboxylic acids don't have such a large difference, so they're pretty close together, okay, uh, some of them, okay? So for the neutral compounds, 
what you're going to get you need to collect two melting point ranges okay one fast and one slow all right but based on this you should be able to identify what you have because one's 80 degrees one's 54 degrees okay so when we're talking fast what what that means is your temperature is increasing five to ten degrees per minute okay so with uh, um, older melt temps, you'll use that dial to control that temperature increase. Um, you've got a digital thermometer to read. Um, with, and then with the slow melting point, once you know what it melts at, so this, this gives you kind of a broad range where to narrow in on. And then this gives you the slow one, the one to two degrees per minute then helps you narrow in on that melting point range, okay? So you want to do this broad one first, okay? Because otherwise, it'll t if you just do the slow one, say you've got one of these carboxylic acids that meets, that uh, melts at 150 degrees, it's going to take you a long time from room temperature to go one to two degrees per minute to find the melting point range, okay? So do the fast one first, make things easier on yourself, then go and do a slow melting point range to figure out what that specific melting point range is, okay? And whether you use um, the, melt, the melt temp with the dial or the melt temp that you program in these temperatures, you will collect both of these, okay? For the neutral compound, you just need these two ranges, one fast, one slow. For the carboxylic acid, You need one fast, one slow, and then you're going to need what is called a mixed melting point. Okay. So if you remember from Gen Chem, when you were talking about um, colligative properties, way back in Gen Chem, so long ago. What happens to a melting point if you have, are collecting the melting point of something that's not pure? Does it increase or decrease? I'm hearing both. Melting point, not free, not boiling point or freezing point. No. Melting point depresses, right? If you've got something that's not pure, so you've got melting point. Remember melting point depression? Does that sound familiar at all? Maybe. Hopefully. So your melting point is going to depress um, if if the solid is impure. Okay. So it will decrease. It also will broaden. It will become a broader range if it's not pure. Okay. So what we're going to do with these carboxylic acids that are so close together in melting point is we are going to, you're going to collect your fast melting point, your slow melting point, and then we're going to do what's called a mixed melting point, okay? And so we have known carboxylic acid vials of these on the shelves in the lab. You're going to take a little bit of that known carboxylic acid and a little bit of your crystallized carboxylic acid and mix them together. So you wanna pick, based on your slow melting point, what you think your carboxylic acid is, okay? Mix the two of them together, and hopefully, when you take the mixed melting point, it's the same as your slow melting point. If it's not, then it's probably going to depress and broaden from that, okay? And so for the mixed melting point, what you want to use is about 20 milligrams. So how many grams is that? Point, point zero 0.02 grams, right? 
of the known carboxylic acid and the unknown, plus your unknown. So you want to use 20 milligrams of each, okay? You want to use the same amount. It's really important that you use the same amount of each to keep them, to make this work. And you want to really crush them together, okay? So don't just take a little bit of one, a little bit of the other. Mix them together and then take the melting point. You want to use your stir rod and really crush them together so that you've got it well mixed, okay? And then you'll collect the melting point. And hopefully that melting point range matches um, matches your slow melting point of your carboxylic acid. Then you found the identity of your unknown. Okay. If it doesn't, then you need to try with another compound that has a similar melting point range and see what you get. Okay. So um, let's go through some examples here of what I mean by matching and not. Okay. So say we have the unknown melting point range, and remember you're always reporting a range, is 100.3 to 101.9 degrees, okay? What would be a good option for mixing it? No, it's kind of hard to see there, but of that list, what would be a good option? First one. Yeah, the two methoxy benzoic acids are really close. Okay, so you mix it. <coughs> the two benzo two methoxy benzoic acid. And so that melting point is 98.100. And you get the mixed melting point, so the mix. Melting point is 99.5 to 101.1 degrees C. So what do you think about that guy? Is that pretty decent? So that would be a good match for your mixed melting point, okay? So if you got that mixed melting point, then you probably would be pretty safe in identifying your unknown as 2-methoxybenzoic acid, okay? So now let's look at another example. Let's say we've got the melting point of the unknown is 149 to 153. Okay. Now, first of all, what do you think about this range versus that range? This one's pretty broad, huh? So it may still be wet or something like that. So be careful with that from the get-go, okay? But 149 to 153, what could we mix it with from that list? Two bromobenzoic acids. Two bromobenzoic would be a good idea. Okay, so we'll mix the two bromobenzoic acids. And its melting point range is 147 to 150. Okay, then we get the mixed melting point is 145 to 148. What do you think about that one? It's narrow. It's a little bit more narrow, but you're lower than even your original melting point, right? So you've depressed it. So this probably is not a good match, okay? So what I would say here is probably this needs to dry a little bit more, maybe, because it's so broad. And then once it dries, maybe try the next higher one, and you'll probably get, get a better match than this guy, okay? But since this depressed from even the original melting point, it's probably not the same, same thing, okay? So kind of be careful with those. Um, with the melt temps, make sure always turn them off and turn the thermometers off when you're not using. They're still going to heat when you um, have them on. So make sure when you're done using them, turn them off and turn the thermometers off so that the next they're ready for the next person. Yeah. Um, with your first example, it depressed as well. I mean, just 
not matter because it's not as much. Of a I mean, it's it's just a very slight one. Whereas this one was like, okay. when you depress four degrees. That's pretty pretty big depression. Um, so be good stewards to everybody else. Um, make sure you turn things off. The other thing is, you need to collect your melting points and the weights of your solids after they've dried. So this week we're going to recrystallize. This is the last week we're working on experiment one. Okay. So these weights and melting points are need will need to be collected in open lab. Okay. So schedule according, you know, plan accordingly. And as soon as you can get into open lab, get in and do it because all of you have to get in and use those melt tests during those specified times. Okay?